Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Allier Strategy Summit. We are so excited to have you for this two-day virtual learning event. Before we go ahead and get kicked off, um, a couple of quick housekeeping items. My name is Jordan Fugger Burmeister. I'm the marketing manager at Allier, um, and I'm one of the moderators that you'll be hearing throughout the event. Just a couple of quick reminders. All of these sessions do have individual links. Um, so the link for the following session will be available in the chat as we wrap up the current session that you're in, or if you've previously registered, um, you can access those through the invite from Zoom. We are going to have a quick Q&A at the end of each of our sessions, so if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit them in the chat to panelists or in the Q&A portal at the bottom. We are going to have all attendees on mute, uh, but we will have some of that live Q&A with the speakers at the end of the presentation. With that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Richard. Thank you, Jordan, so much. And welcome, everybody, to the Allure Strategy Summit 2021. We couldn't be more proud to bring to you these two days full of content and lots of exciting sessions focusing on people, on technology, on process and how all that comes together to form strategy. So this represents a lot of hard work over many, many months of a lot of folks at Allure. I'm just one of many. Again, my name is Richard Merrill. I'm one of the partners with Allure. And we've been just really um, excited to bring this content to you and excited by the response that we've gotten. We have uh, a number of organizations actually participating today um, in what is our second virtual conference. Last year, we held the Allure Treasury Experience and got a really positive feedback from that. Um, and people are excited to join and to learn and to hear from our experts and learn about some best practices and some new cutting edge technology. That really spurred the idea to bring another summit to you this year, focusing on people, technology, and process. And we have over 75 organizations attending the summit over these two days. Many of those organizations have more than one person attending. In fact, a good chunk of, uh, of you have three, four, five, and even six folks attending. So again, we've been really overwhelmed in a very positive way by all the feedback um, that we've been getting. And it's organizations that really host, come from a whole host of industries, such as insurance, telecommunications, healthcare, um, coming from tech and tribal governments and media and, and, and national labs and insurance and as well as professional services. But just a whole host of industries and leaders from industries represented here, including consumer products and industrial services. All in all, over 25 industries represented by the attendee, attendees at this two-day summit. And, and these are companies that really are coming from all over. Um, companies that really represent a coast-to-coast -coast presence. Um, you know, from, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, including our friends in Alaska and Hawaii. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, so good morning from San Francisco. Extra mahalo to the folks dialing in from um, Hawaii, because I know it's extra early from them. And we even have uh, companies represented um, from abroad, from our friends in Canada, Europe, and Japan. So again, we're really excited about uh, about this conference in this two days. And, and what I really wanna do is welcome everybody and then introduce, you know, our kickoff, um, uh, the, the keynote speaker. And the, the keynote speaker is someone I very much admire. Um, it's Susan Page. She wrote this really tremendous process improvement book that came out a few years ago and had a really good response in the marketplace. Um, Susan has taught me a lot through her book, a lot, um, in my meetings with her. She's really helped inform how I approach my process work and what we do in terms of methodology. So I'm, I'm really excited that she's joining us today. Now I will say due to a family um, issue, she wasn't able to join in person, but she was still was very excited to share her content with all of you. And so she very graciously recorded it in advance. And so we're actually going to be throwing it back to Jordan, who's going to um, play the video from Susan, and then afterwards we'll have a live Q&A um, where Susan's let me answer some of questions on her behalf. I'm so pleased to join you today, and I want to thank Alir for having me as part of the Alir Strategy Summit. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person virtually today, but if you have any questions after my presentation, 
please feel free to email me. You'll see my email address at the end of my presentation, and I'm sure that Alir can answer any questions you may have. Today, in order to support Alir's theme for the conference of people, technology, and process, I'll share concepts of my business process improvement book because improving business processes touches on all three of these components. The first one, people, I refer to employees as process workers, and they deliver the steps in a business process. As we all know, labor costs continue to increase over time. Their second component is technology. And if I can borrow words from Bill Gates, quote, applying technology to an efficient process will magnify the efficiency, quote. And the third component process is what I specifically address today. I understand that many of you focus on administrative or back office business processes, such as purchasing, accounts payable, payroll, benefits administrations, and so forth. My background is around administrative processes for the most part, and I've worked in several industries, most recently in the entertainment industry in Orlando, Florida. I was part of the ERP team that implemented SAP after using PeopleSoft for several years. Now, before I jump into the 10 steps to business process improvement, I want you to know that I wrote this book to make business process improvement approachable to everyone because that's where the power of business process improvement lies. That's the name of my book. So to keep it simple, I avoided technical terminology and stayed with really simple language. So as you read my book, you won't see terms like Six Sigma, Lean, Quality, or Reengineering terms. And when I use the term customer, I'm referring to an external customer who pays for your goods and services. And when I use the term client, I'm referring to the internal client in an organization. So let's take a look at the goals for a business process improvement effort. There are three main reasons why you would do that. Effectiveness, efficiency, and adaptability. When you think about effectiveness, the question is, does the process deliver what your customer or client wants? Making your business process effective means designing the process to make it relevant to your customer base. And what about efficiency? Does the business process minimize the use of resources? In designing your process, you want to ensure the best use of your valuable resources. Because as I just mentioned, people cost money and how you use your talent matters. And finally, think about adaptability. Is your business process easily adaptable? Is it flexible to changing needs? When you design your process, design a flexible process. I mean, the bottom line is when you invest your time and resources to improve a process, you want to positively affect your revenue cycle. So let me share this 10 steps to business process improvement. And I like to share this visual at the beginning of ever any improvement um, effort so people understand where they'll be going over the next few weeks or months. To me, it's all about getting customers or clients engaged from the very beginning and knowing the journey always helps. Each step you see here builds on the previous step. So the order of these steps is important. So let me start with step one. This step is important when you have multiple processes to deal with so that you know how many business processes you have facing you and you can prioritize what's most important, thus allowing you to focus on priorities first. But sometimes you may have a single process, and if it's already been identified, for example, the purchasing process, then this step isn't so important. But assuming that you are facing multiple processes and you're trying to decide where to start, you do this by identifying all the business processes, or what I like to call building an inventory. And you can look at building that inventory in different ways, depending on what your responsibility is. You can look at cross-functional processes. So for example, human resources, finance, sales and marketing, engineering, there are varying business processes in a company and looking at them from a cross-functional perspective is good for an enterprise approach. You can also focus on business processes within one function for example, the business processes within human resources may include things like recruiting, compensation, training. You can lastly even make it work even more streamlined by looking at business processes within a specific department. 
For example, all the recruitment processes or all the compensation processes. Once you decide on your approach and the inventory is built, you can apply criteria that will help you identify where to focus your time. So this example shows you some of the common prioritization criteria that I use. So you can see impact. That's the number of people affected by the process. What's the client level if it's internal? Implementation, time to market. So how long will it take you to improve this process? Is it a total mess and you know it's going to take you a long time? Funding, do you have the funding to work on that process and improve it? Or the next cycle, for example, if it's a merit increase process and you just did your merit increases for the year, it's a long ways away, so that may get a lower score. Current state is another um, criterion you can look at. What's the level of the customer or client satisfaction with the current process? How much pain exists in the process? And does the process even exist? And then finally, value. What's the benefit or return of improving the business process? And if you apply criteria like this example shows, you can weight the criteria. And you can see, you can decide if one criterion is more important than another. In this example, you can see that impact has a 35% weight, and that's the greatest of all of the four criteria. You also see the calculation depicted in this example. The budgeting process has a subtotal for impact of four shown in the red box. And you can see that when the 35% weight factor for impact is applied, it receives a 1.4 score. At the end of this step, you have a process prioritization matrix or table. You know where to start because you know your priority. In this example shown here, you see only two business processes, but you can see that you would start with the budgeting process because it has a higher total score of 5.8. So now that you know after this step, what your priority is, you can move forward to step two, building the foundation for the rest of the work. Step two helps teams or someone unfamiliar with the process to develop a common understanding of the process you'll be working on. I believe step two is one of the most important steps available to you, and I never skip this step. In addition to creating a common understanding of the business process, this step also helps you to know the beginning and the end of the process, the boundaries. Knowing the boundaries helps you to avoid scope creep, which happens so easily in this type of work. Uh, this step also allows everyone involved in the work to define the customer needs. And you may be surprised in some of these efforts that not everyone agrees who the customer or client is in an effort. As you build this foundation, you also have the opportunity to clarify terminology. We find in this work, words are so important and many people have differing understandings. Last but very important, the step also helps you to collectively define what success will look like in the future state business process. So how do you go about doing this? I call the document that you see um, on this slide, the scope definition document, but you can call it anything. The key is to specify information that will keep you on track. So the description in English, write a definition of the business process for someone who doesn't know the process. This is the time to define terminology. For example, what is a transfer versus a promotion? Is there a difference between an applicant and a candidate? Clarify terminology that may cause a problem later. Then you have boundaries. Identify the start and the end of the business process so you do not have to um, deal with scope creep. For example, in the hiring process, do you start with sourcing the candidate or do you go further back to approval for the headcount or staffing? Then process responsibilities, just including a high level major tasks. For example, if the recruitment process, the responsibilities may include sourcing, pre-screening, interviewing, background checks. And if something is intentionally excluded, include that here as well. Then you have the customer, client, and their needs. May seem like an easy task to do, but it will take some time. Stakeholders and needs is a little bit easier. And then measurements of success. Whatever you define here should support the customer client needs you defined earlier. 
Later in this work, we'll turn these measurements of success into actual metrics. Now here you see another version of the scope definition document, an alternate view. This example was for some internal work that I did with the compensation department who struggled with all the different types of employee changes. You can see here that the document differs from the previous slide because it wasn't necessary to list the process responsibilities, the customer client needs, or measurements of success. And really the purpose of showing this alternate view is so you can see the flexibility of that scope definition document. At the end of this step, you know your scope and you have agreements. And now that you understand the basics, you can move on to building the process map. Step three addresses how to draw a process map. <clears throat> and defining the current state process map helps you to develop a common understanding. So while you're starting developing a common understanding when you created the scope definition document in step two, the process map gets into more detail that will help in future steps. It also helps you to develop a baseline for improvement. You have to know where you, where you are in order to understand how much you've improved. That is, if you want to measure your improvement effort. And lastly, it's also a vehicle for collecting background information, which will help you later in the number of resources that a business process consumes, defining the number of resources, which is process cost, and how long the process takes from beginning to end, cycle time. And how do you go about building a process map? Well, I always start by determining whether I'm going to build a high level or a detail level process map. And I move more towards a high level process map if the process is very undefined, there's little shared understanding, it's highly complex, very variable, and has a lot of sub processes. On the other hand, I'll build a detailed process map if it's used often, if it's used by many people if it has high turnover in that process, and if it's a sub-process of another process. So start building the process map by defining activities. And I find that getting started is usually the hardest part in building a process map. So revisit the scope definition document that you created in step two. Go back and revisit what you defined as a starting point under boundaries, because that would typically be your first activity in the process map. And as you, process, as you draw the process map, spend some time documenting the details, the key discussion points that occur as you're building the process map. Make sure to include any potential problems that surface during that discussion. Don't try to solve the issues now, just, you know, that will come later. But I like to put a caution symbol or a thermometer, something on that activity that reminds me that it's a potential problem area. You can embellish the process map with whatever icons and notations are helpful to recall key information. And at this point, you have a pretty good understanding of the process and you can uh, move to identifying what it costs to deliver the process. In this step, you estimate the time and cost. And I use the term estimate because I usually find that for administrative processes, it's usually good enough. You can do, and I have, a time study or use another collection method, but generally estimating works if you ask the right employees. And why should you do this? Well, you want to know how long the process takes from start to finish, which is cycle time. This is what customers see, and it includes waiting or elapsed time. Process time is how long each activity takes. You also want to learn the amount of labor consumed by the process. And gathering this information helps you to set improvement targets. And the how is really very basic. You add process and cycle time to the map. As this example shows, I generally write the process time on the left-hand side of the activity box. You can see that in red in this image. And the cycle time on the right side of the activity, you see that in black. So for this activity, in the first activity on this process map, you see 20 minutes of process time and one hour of cycle time. And after the work session, I individually translate process time to labor costs. For example, this slide shows a summary of the process and cycle time for the recognition bonus award process. And if you look at the left side, process time, and say I use 75 minutes in between the 70 and 87 minutes, 
um, it equates to 0.6 of an FTE, full-time equivalent. And that's assuming it's 75 minutes, there's a thousand transactions a year. Um, and let's say that employee that I'm, or all the employees in the process, probably in this case, one employee makes $50,000 a year, 0.6 of that is 35,000. So you know that this process is costing you a labor of $35,000. That's not a fully loaded employee, so you may want to add tools, overhead costs, you know, benefits, software applications to make it a fully loaded employee cost. After you've done this, you can cut the data in a lot of different ways. You can look at cost per transaction, cycle time per process, and so forth. Now, before you have a pretty good understanding of the process and what it takes to deliver the process, but before moving on to step six, you have one more thing to do. And this step helps you to verify and ensure that the data you've collected, you have a nice solid foundation before moving to the improvement stage. The last thing you need at the end of all of your work is someone challenging your baseline information. So this step is important, particularly if you estimated processes. So validate the data and your assumptions. And you can do this by walking people through the process map. Consider employees who work on the process on a day-to-day -day basis, stakeholders who care about the outcomes, your sponsor, of course, and anyone else who may have a need to voice an opinion. After you validate this information, you want to make changes to the process map, time estimates, um, whatever else may need to change. Once you have agreement, though, then you're ready to move on to the improvement step. And here is as part of the work. It's simply, it's pretty simple why this step is important. Number one, to deliver an effective business process that provides what the customer or client wants. Number two, to make the business process as efficient as possible by reducing process costs. And number three, to ensure the process is adaptable to changing needs. And we all know that the only constant in life is change. So how do we do that? By applying improvement techniques. And here you see the improvement wheel. And I always start at the top with bureaucracy and highlight bureaucratic activities in the process map. Next, I examine value added. This is all about defining the steps in the process that are important to the customer. And if you think of it, if you're charged by process step and the customers could see the steps, would they pay for the step? If not, it probably should be eliminated. Next, examine um, the process map of duplication and simplification. For example, do multiple departments keep similar records or does dual data entry occur? For complex forms or unnecessary handoffs, um, are there any uh, complex forms or unnecessary handoffs between departments? And handoffs present opportunities for mistakes. Cycle time reduction. Look at the waiting time that occurs between activities in the business process and complete an analysis to identify why something takes so long. Lastly, and very important, look at automation opportunities. If you work at the enterprise level, you have more opportunities, but even simple everyday tools can help automate some steps in a process. And I put automation last intentionally because you want to automate an efficient process, not an inefficient process as you can see so nicely expressed by Bill Gates on the right-hand side of the slide several years ago. Automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. Automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. You may also have the question, should the technology drive the process or should the process drive the technology? I believe the process should drive the technology because you should automate an efficient, not an inefficient process. And today it's becoming easier to do this with large ERP solutions as they allow for more and more configuration. The last point I want to make is that the order in which you apply these techniques is key. Just like the order of the steps is important, applying the improvement techniques is important too in a certain order. For example, you don't want to simplify a form or keep an Excel spreadsheet that's bureaucratic when it should simply be eliminated. That's why you should focus on bureaucracy first. And with the new business process identified now, you can focus on step seven. But before we review that step, 
I want to share two upcoming seminars that ALIR is offering to support the automation step. Improving AP business processes to make them more efficient and automating processes with RPA and chatbots. Now this step seven helps you to focus on preventing mistakes, creating tools to help employees do their job easier and developing metrics to make sure the process works as expected. So how do you go about doing this? Adding internal controls to make certain mistakes don't happen. As you built the process map back in step three, you probably remember that I suggested you identify potential problem areas by adding a caution sign. Now you may have eliminated the potential problem in step six when you redesign the new business process. But if not, this is the time where you want to document how you will ensure that problem does not occur. You should also take inventory of what software applications your company uses. You may have defined, defined many of these in step six. The goal is to maximize the use of existing applications and develop any new tools. Then defining the metrics you plan to use to evaluate the success of the business process. This is where you want to revisit the foundation you established in step two and review the measurements of success that you defined. Turn the key ones into metrics and try to include one metric for effectiveness, one for efficiency, and one for adaptability. And here again, you see that Alir is offering a session on improving data analytics and visualization, which may help you in defining meaningful metrics. Now, before introducing a new process or tool to your company, it's a good idea to do a test run. And step eight, can range from a simple to a detailed review, depending on the significance of the change. In this step, test everything you developed and make any necessary changes. So if you work in the technology sector, you may be familiar with test plans, which include what you have to test, the process, the tools, the documentation, the metrics. Who has a responsibility for the testing? Is it one department or many? Are there global, par global partners to include? Where will the testing occur? Multiple or single locations? Will the testing sites have any potential technology challenges? If you plan to test in different countries, are there any geographic requirements? When? So what's the best time to test? You may have to avoid peak periods. Perhaps you have to avoid month end or year end, uh, perhaps a holiday or seasonal peaks. And finally, how? So creating tests you know, scenarios with test sets. What are the goals for each item being tested? And as you conduct the testing, you need to track and resolve the problem. So you need to put some kind of feedback mechanism in place. For example, daily phone calls, an issue resolution log to track the problems. I would also like to categorize problems as either technical or usability issues. And also how critical are they to implementation? So the severity level of the issue that's uncovered. And Elir, again, is offering a nice session on testing strategy, which will provide more details on how to conduct a successful testing effort. Once you know everything works as planned, you're ready to implement. So that takes us to step nine. But why this step is obvious. You want to gain the benefits of your improvement. But how do you do this? And this really is a change management process. You develop an impact analysis, which is something I do to track the organizational changes that have to occur. I find the impact analysis to be one of the most useful tools I've developed. It's simply a matrix, but it outlines what needs to change, what's the rationale behind the change, who's impacted by the change, and what potential problems or political potholes might you encounter with the change. After you've created that, communicating the change, developing a communication plan. So defining the five points of a communication plan, the audience, the goals of the communication, the key message points, the vehicles, and the dates. Also developing a training plan, the audience, learning objectives, what approach will you take, who's the facilitator, and what are the dates for the training. Again, Alir has another uh, session on building a successful change management strategy, which will provide more details on gaining user adoption. 
So at this point, you've done a lot of work and it's worth some time at the end of a business process improvement effort to look ahead and put a plan in place to revisit the process on a regular basis. So you don't have to go through the same level of detail again. And this takes us to step 10. This step helps you sustain the improvements. It allows the process to stay competitive, to continue meeting customer client needs which change over time, and it keeps pace with changing technology. So how do you do this? While continuous improvement is partly a mindset, you can also put some concrete tools in place. Following the continuous improvement cycle means following the four parts of the cycle. Evaluate, determining opportunities, test, make changes and try it out, assess, decide if the changes work, what were the results, and execute deploying the change. You can do these steps very quickly. What will keep you on track to make certain you regularly evaluate the business process is the plan and the schedule. In the plan, you decide how often you want to revisit key activities like customer client needs, test internal controls, review measurement data. In the schedule you see depicted here, you put a calendar against the plan. For example, if you look at the requisition process, say you decided to review the measurement data on a monthly basis. And here you can see that the plan to do that is on the first of each month. If you decide to review stakeholder needs twice a year, in this example, you can see you'll do that on May 1 and November 1. So in summary, you see the repeat of the 10 steps to business process improvement here and the result of each of the steps. So in step one, you have a process prioritization table. In step two, you have a scope definition document. Step three, you have a current state process map. Step four, you know the process and cycle time and the costs associated. In step five, you have a validated baseline. In step six, you have an improved business process. In step seven, you have controls, tools, and metrics in place. Step eight, you have confirmation that it works. Step nine, you have a new process in place. And in step 10, you have a plan for the future. As I said earlier, each step builds on the previous step or steps, so it's important to do them in order. I really want to thank you for your time and to Alir for having me as part of their Alir Strategy Summit. I hope you all learned something new today. Thank you. So um, that was uh, a, a great presentation uh, from Susan. Um, I'm so happy she was able to put that together for us. Let me turn my video back on. And um, what we want to do now is open it up for uh, a live Q and A, sharing. Uh, see if I can answer any questions people might have um, from from her presentation. So again, I I really enjoy uh, Susan's book so much. Um, you know, she's a uh, executive at a major entertainment company um, headquartered in Orlando, leading um, enterprise applications, and I know many of you are involved with it as well. And she has a lot of great ideas. I particularly like her improvement technique wield and the idea about simplifying before you automate, because you know we don't always. Uh, sometimes there's a paper form, and we just think that paper form always has to be there. But maybe you can rethink the process and simplify it and get rid of it. Um, so we're just sort of uh, see if there's any questions um, that I can help answer um, as we go through this. And so I see one question around approximately how long does this process take and can you use it on both small and large projects? And that's actually a really great question. And the answer to that is yes, you can definitely use it on a smaller um, one-off process. Um, I've certainly used it just looking at a one single step or a number of steps in a process. Um, you can also take a step back. She, you know, she talked about in um, step one about creating a process inventory. So that inventory could be focused on a single process like AP. We're gonna have an AP automation session coming up in a little bit, or it may be focusing across the board, across the entire financials. And then the duration of the project then really depends on, on how what you're focusing on. So a single process can take just a couple of weeks and across the board and, and across financials in that example process, you know, may take many, few months. So I hope that helps answer that question. 
And then I see uh, another question coming up. Um, around the idea of incorporating current problems and metrics on my map is new to me, but interesting. You know, I, and I really like that. And it's one of the reasons her book resonates with me. Um, you know, at Alia, we like to call it process mapping 2.0 um, because it's, it's not just describing the current state process, but it's putting a lot of additional data, rich data onto it. Um, for those who are familiar with our methodology, we put what are called process attributes onto maps listing everything from policies and procedures and audit points and metrics and configurations and more onto the map. And, um, you know, the question goes on to say, can you talk more about what uh, the tools you might use to capture that data? And, and I sure can. And actually in the next presentation, we talk a little bit about metrics and, and, and how you can capture that data. And what I like to do is sort of use a, a decision matrix, right? Um, and, and really start off with defining the metric um, and defining the metric early on in the process so that as you're configuring the system, perhaps it's part of an upgrade or an implementation, you understand what data you want to capture and then can really build that report, build that will query into your overall design. And you may have instances um, where the system already collects the data, such as having timestamp data or user data but then just doesn't report it. And there are opportunities then to sort of turn on some of that functionality. And I know some people may be worried about turning on some of that auditing and tracking because they're afraid about increasing table size and others. There's actually a really cool session, I think later today, maybe tomorrow on data analytics and a tool with Kibana that really lets you get access to that data in a really cool, exciting way that doesn't hit on performance. And then, as I talk about in uh, the next session, if you're not able to actually get the system to give you the data, which is always the case, um, you can always go to other estimation tools. Um, so you can conduct surveys and gather the data in maybe a little more of a qualitative manner. Um, and she mentioned in her presentation around actually doing time studies, and I myself have done that. You know, I've been doing process improvement and transformation for 25 years, and I've sat many a time with a stopwatch timing transactions. Thankfully, we don't have to do that as much anymore because the systems can do that for us. So I hope that gave you a little bit of idea and a little bit of insight. And if you want to learn more, um, maybe think about attending the next presentation or the one on data analytics. And then let's see, uh, another question is, I feel like change management is always overlooked and often um, uh, wait until the final stages. And, and so I sort of agree with that. You know, um, I'm a process person at heart. I'm a change management person at heart. Um, this approach, the, the question, the, the person asking the question says was different. Um, you know, can you share your thoughts on why it's so important to build consensus early? And, you know, and I, and, and, and I think, you know, you know, many folks say it's important to build consensus. It's important to identify the stakeholders. It's important to make sure you all know the end goal. And it's important to make sure you're all marching in line towards the same end goal. Um, and, and what we talk about actually again in the next presentation, <laughs> I'm sort of setting up my next presentation, but what we talk about in the next presentation is not only gaining alignment early on, but then maintaining alignment throughout the life of the of the project. Because I think sometimes uh, a shortcoming of change management can be, let's have a kickoff, let's get everyone on the same page, and then let's go away and not really engage those stakeholders again. And what we like to do at Olio, and what Susan likes to do, and what some of you might like to do is really figure out ways to engage them every step of the way and keep them actively engaged. And maybe do things like stakeholder analyses to figure out who you need to engage and, and who you may not need to engage. Um, and, and so I, I think uh, engagement is incredibly important early and often. And when we um, do a project, whether it's a process project or a technology project, or we're transforming an organization, we always look to start with who are the key stakeholders we need to work with, and then how do we move on from there and keep them engaged throughout. So again, I hope I'm doing a good job answering those questions on the fly um, in, in place of Susan. Um, and I'll just see if we have any other questions coming in. If not, I may take a moment um, just to, oops, one more. Can you share the book again? 
and tell me where to buy it. Yes, I sure can. I, I really love this book. I'm going to cover my own face maybe with it. But um, I'll just read off the title. It's The Power of Business Process Improvement. And the author is Susan Page. It's available wherever you find books. I happen to get my copy on Amazon. Um, but wherever you find books, um, I definitely encourage you to get it. If you can buy it from your local bookstore, all the better, support local businesses. And uh, what we want to do now is, um, you know, as we're wrapping up the Q&A, you know, Susan uh, mentioned a lot of the upcoming uh, sessions we have planned for today and planned for tomorrow. And there's a, just a couple of more that she didn't mention. And so I just want to talk about two people sessions. One is prioritizing project management, a case study. That's going to be uh, hosted by Michael Merrill, one of our co-CEOs and founding partners, a little later today. And we also have one tomorrow called Maximizing the Value of Project Management Practice by Robert Hill, one of our most experienced project managers. And they'll both be sharing a lot of insights and ideas about project management, which I think is really important. There's also a really interesting strategy session tomorrow, how to select the right technology for your business, building an application roadmap. That's something a lot of clients have turned to Allure for over the years. We know it's a difficult landscape to navigate. And we have a lot of proven techniques and proven methodologies and consultants with proven skills that can really help navigate that. And we have two of our thought leaders and practice leads, uh, Edmund and Jason, who are gonna be sharing some thoughts with you tomorrow about building an application roadmap. So a lot of really cool sessions, uh, lots of links in the chat. Georgian has been great enough to have been putting links in the chat for the sessions that Susan mentioned, as well as these um, additional sessions. It's not too late to register. We have had a lot of tremendous feedback, but the nice thing about Zoom is there's always room in a Zoom room. <laughs> and uh, so um, please remember to follow us on all of our social media. We're going to try to wrap this up about five minutes early, um, well, actually five minutes before the end of the hour, uh, so that everyone has time you know, to take a break, check their email, and then get to the next session. Definitely follow us on social media. We have a lot of great content out there, especially on YouTube, a lot of free webinars um, and information that is out there. And then for those of you who are sticking around for the next session, I'll see you um, at the the top of the hour, depending on your time zone, that's an 11 o'clock time zone central time. It's only nine o'clock um, Pacific time for me, uh, a little earlier for our friends joining from Hawaii, but it's gonna be a strategy session entitled Overcoming Problems Leaders Are Faced With Today. And again, my name is Richard Merrill. I'm one of the partners with the Leo, and I'm really excited to bring you um, some ideas and concepts uh, about that. So thank you all so much for joining our keynote this morning. And we sure do welcome you to the first of uh, many sessions over these two days for the Allure Strategy Summit, uh, hashtag Strategy Summit 21. Thank you all so much. And we look forward to engaging with you over these next two days.